own um, plot A, which um, isn't really monitored that much anymore. It was just um, counts of annual plants. And then plot B, which are mapped perennial plants, and it's a quite large plot. It's um, now um, 10, 10 meter by 10 meter plots. But when Shreve set them up, there were eight um, plots. Okay, and then in 1936 and 48, the plots were resampled again. In 57, um, Ray Turner with the USGS took over sampling. In 68, he rediscovered five of these plots that um, Shreve had originally been sampling himself. And then between 1968 and 2012, nine of these plots, so all of these yellow dots here in plot B, this green plot here, um, are sampled approximately every nine years. Um, oh, and I just want to mention Robert Webb, who was pretty integral in the samplings between um, the 80s and 2012. He was the one leading the teams out there. And so what do these plots actually look like? Um, so this is a picture of one of the B plots. And as you can see, there's these white borders going around the plot to denote the 10 meters by 10 meters. Um, and they, the researchers would go out and go to every plant in this 10 meter by 10 meter plot and mark it and record it. And so what that looked like depended on when we were sampling. So back uh, between 1906 and 19. 78, they did this actually on grid paper. So on the plots, they'd actually put in more um, meter by meter grids so that they could transfer the meter by meter grids onto these this grid paper here. And so you can see these dots here, which would represent the, the trunk of a plant. And then they would sketch a general um, outline of the canopy cover of that plant. And then moving into the digital age between 1993 and 2012, this mapping was done using something called a total station, which essentially allows for direct digitization of these plant maps. So this is what the, that would look like here, where the number is the stem. I guess this is a better representation here. So the stem of this plant is here, and then you can see the canopy of the plant around here and they're color coded by different different species. Um, and then in 2010, um, a prior Ike Russell postdoc, Susanna Rodriguez Berutica, came in and digitized all of these old maps between 1906 and 1978. Um, and what another big effort her and her team did was tracking individuals over time. So if individual um, number 75 was there in the prior mapping or the mapping after that, is it that same individual or is it a new individual that had come up? Um, she really worked out the algorithms to link individuals in these maps over time. And then in 2013, she published the data behind all of this um, in ecology. And so just a quick summary of the plots. Um, they were mapped every three to 22 years, um, but uh, in general, they were mapped every nine years. On each plot, all semi-woody to woody perennials um, were consistently mapped and cacti. And this digitization that Susanna did allowed us to track individuals through time. I guess I'll pause here and see if there's any questions. Feel free, feel free to also post questions in the chat. I'm keeping an eye on that. It's hard to keep an eye on hands raised. Yeah, thanks, Trika. I, yeah, I can't see um, hand raising either. So just yell at me if you have a question um, or let Trika know through the chat. Okay, um, so that's kind of a brief overview of what the data looks like. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about some of the strengths of this data. Um, so 
it's a 106 years of data. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and it really allows us to be able to start examining what's going on in these really long lived communities. You can think of Palo Verde and Suwaro and how they are probably surviving for 80 or more years. And so if we want to know the dynamics or how communities are changing through time, we really need longer time frames because all of our species are so old where a lot of them are. And it allows us to also start beginning to maybe see signals that um, climate is having and changing these communities, which will help us understand how these communities might change with future climate change, um, whether they're sensitive, things like this. And then another strength is that with this tracked individual data, we have over 10,000 individuals tracked over time. So we have a lot of data of when an individual pops up, when an individual dies. Um, and with this data, we can really speak to the life history strategies or the certain, the longevity, the recruitment rates that we're seeing in these desert plant communities and whether this changes with different climate regimes and what species might be particularly vulnerable um, to, to climate changes. And then the last large assessment of these plots were um, in 1978, Deborah Goldberg, who I referenced earlier, who gave that talk about this, what she found in this paper with Ray. Um, but we now have 34 years more data. And so what are we seeing? Are we seeing similar patterns? Are we seeing new patterns? Um, we now can add this data to, to our baseline knowledge. So starting with um, the first strength, and then I'll talk about some of the questions we derived from it. Um, but I just wanted to show here, this is one of the B plots over time. So Ray Turner and his team also took repeat pho photography, photos, <laughs> did repeat photography of these plots through time. So we can see in one of these B plots, we had maybe a dead choya, some Ocotillo creosote, and then a bunch of creosote might have come in, then things died off, and then a suaro pops up and more choyas in 20, 2009. You can really see over these 60 years, um, or I guess fifth, closer to 50 years, the, the, the plant community is changing. And so are we able to actually capture patterns in these changes? Are they shifting directionally um, or not over time? So that'll bring us to some of the first questions. Have there been directional shifts in these Tumamot plant communities over the past 106 years? And how different are they from what they were in uh, at in 2000, or sorry, in 1906? Um, and so just a bit of a methodological thing so we can interpret and understand the graphs that I'm about to show you. Um, so when you have a plant community that has multiple species in it, so our plant communities have around 30 to 40 species, how do you uh, visualize that in a two-dimensional space? Um, and so there are these statistical techniques that allow us to reduce abundance and um, cover data essentially into two to three dimensions. And we can really quantify what a community looks like and compare it to other communities or through time. So the graphs that I'll be showing you look something like this. We have one, we have a two axis space and we have a point on that space. And this point denotes all of the species that are within a certain community. And then when we compare it to another community, we can know that the Communities that fall closer together are more similar in their composition, whereas the communities that are further away from each other are less similar in, in their species composition. So for instance, in this example, community in one and two are pretty similar in their plant com um, community structure, but communities one and three and two and three are quite different. And we can also look at this through time. So if instead these points are all the same community, um, but different points in time, we can look at how communities are changing 
between 1906 and 1928 and between 1928 and 1938. So in this example, we can see there wasn't really a shift in these first 22 years, but there was a really big shift in these past 10 years. And so this is how we're looking at these community changes through time. So getting to the data, um, uh, on the left here, this is data just looking at which species are present or absent from a community. And on the right here, it's also incorporating those covers that we saw. So the relative abundance of creosote, for example, instead of ambrosia. And then in the top, there's gonna to be two color codings and that denotes the two soil types that the communities are growing on. And I'll explain why we did that later. But um, based on the map, you saw some plots are up on the hill in the rocky basaltic andesite substrates, and then some are in the lower flats of Tumamak Hill. And so they have this alluvium um, substrate. Um, and so these are all the different communities over time. And there's some striking patterns here. The first is as you move along axis one, so from left to right, you can see there's a big differentiation depending on the soil type that the communities are growing in. So whether you're growing in an alluvium-based substrate, so on the bottom bajadas of the hill, or if you are growing on the rocky um, basaltic andesite slopes of the hill, you'll find different, different community types depending on those areas. And so because um, a lot of the community change going left to right is due to substrate, when we're talking about changes over time, we're really examining how communities are changing going bottom to top, top to bottom along axis two. I feel like I lost my cursor, okay. Perfect, and then I just plotted the arrows here so you can see how some communities are moving pretty directionally um, straight up, some are kind of moving around in, in a circle. And so what is this, what, what are these shifts even meaning? Um, and so here I've broken the species compositions down into different life forms, so cactus, shrubs, suffertescent herbs, so essentially somewhat woody, semi-woody semi to woody herbs that pop up per, um, perennially, and uh, trees and shrubs. And so as you can see, there's a big, pretty big pattern of as you shift al along and um, this second axis here from bottom to top, you're getting an increase in the abundance of cacti. So as we're moving this way, we have more cacti species that are present. And so these two communities here, for example, are shifting from having less um, cacti species to more cacti species over time. And then with the relative abundances, we can also look how communities are shifting um, over time. And we still see these um, distinctions based on substrate type defining the communities along this axis here. And so again, we're focusing on changes this way when thinking about community change over time. And these communities, there's not great patterns in how the species are shifting, but what, what I've kind of put in my mind is it's the dominance of this ambrosia species. So um, triangle leaf bursage, I think is the common name of that species. So as you go from bottom to top, you're getting a decreased dominance of that species. So this community here had maybe a high abundance of ambrosia and over time that abundance has decreased. And so these are pretty messy um, graphs. And so coming back to this question of are there directional shifts, what we did is we took the second axis and plotted it a long time. And so here we have the year of the survey on the X axis and on the Y axis, we have that second axis. So remember for presence absence, if we're down here, we have a low abundance of cactus. If we're up here, we have a high abundance of cactus. On this graph, if we're down here, we have a high abundance of ambrosia. On this graph, we have a low abundance of ambrosia. 
And so plotting all of the points over time, we can see a slight general increase along this second axis here. So this would also mean a slight increase in the presence of cacti species over time in these plots. But we don't see any pattern with the relative abundance. The, the dominance of ambrosia hasn't been consistently changing over time. Um, and there's no directional shift in the abundance of species in these communities. Um, but there is a directional shift in the, in the presence of cacti species. Now, Charlotte, I have a question. When you're saying these communities, mm -hmm. and in the previous slide, they had you had uh, different specific communities. Are those different plots, or di I'm not understanding exactly what you mean by communities, because it means so many different things. <laughs> sure. Yeah. No. Thank you for that clarification question. Um, so anything that's connected to uh, a line is the community here. So this is plot 17, and this is just different time points. So this here is one community. Well, I guess this here is one local community. I would say the desert um, lab plants is all just one community. So we're really talking about local communities, which I've just been using the word community um, as a placeholder. Um, but I would say all of these plants are within the community of the Desert Lab on Tumamak Hill. Um, and then each sample that we take, each plot that Spalding and Shreve set up is a local community within that larger community. And we're talking about the trends in these local communities. That, that makes more sense. So essentially each one of those uh, connected is one of the plots which represent a plant community. Yes. Yeah, so this is, yeah, this is one of the plots. And then in this graph here, this dot is one of the plots in, in one point in time. Thank you. So it's the same dot, just graphed differently, I guess. Yeah. Awesome, thanks for that question. Um, and so just out of curiosity, or if we want to know how different are these communities um, compared to the 1906 community, what we can do is plot again over time. Um, but on the y-axis here, this is a measure of how, how different communities are, how spread out they are in that multidimensional space. Are they close together? And if they're close together, then that means um, they'll be close to zero or are they far apart? And if they are, they're more dissimilar from each other and they'll be up on this top end of the y-axis. And so for the presence and absence of species, we see um, there was a big shift in communities within the first 20 years, which I forgot to mention this in the introduction, but in 1906, they also fenced Tumamak to exclude grazing. So it's possible that this is a bounce back of the plant communities in response to grazing. Um, but like we don't have any controls to know what the plant communities look like with grazing. So we can't say that definitively. Um, and then after that, the, the communities have been pretty similar in the sense that they're all around 60% um dissimilar from from the 1906 communities um oops and then likewise with the relative abundance um we see a lot of the shift is happening in the first couple of years um but again in 2012 or where we are now perhaps we're roughly 50 percent different from where we were in 1906. Okay, so coming back to those initial questions of have there been directional shifts in these plant communities? And we know that the presence of cacti has slightly increased, but the relative abundance of species don't shift directionally. And then um, we know that the communities are roughly 50% um, dissimilar or share 50% similarity to the 1906 communities in the majority of this turnover in species occurred within the first 20-ish years. 
Um, but what about climate? Um, I've been telling you that we're looking at how climate's going to influence these changes, but I haven't yet talked about it. Um, so to look at the influence of climate in driving these community shifts, we took a, a bit of a different approach <clears throat> in that we focused um, within a census interval. So we were looking at if there's little community change between 1948 and 1960, is that due to the, the climate regime that was going on during that time? So in this example that I laid out here for you, um, we see little change between 48 and 60 and a lot of change in uh, 80, uh, between 1985 and 1993. And so maybe that's because between 1985 and 1993, there was a lot of hot days, which might change communities, whereas we don't see that same number of hot, extreme hot days um, between 48 and 60. Um, and similarly, just another example, between 48 and 60, there was a high amount of drought going on. So maybe the drought made communities go stagnant, whereas in 85 and 93, um, there was more drought or less drought. And so maybe communities were able to shift. So we're um, just to clarify, we're looking at how much communities are shifting in an interval and whether that's related to the climate regime going on during that time. Um, <clears throat> and so some of the things, the climate variables that we tested, um, we looked at, sorry, I have like a big tickle in my throat. I haven't talked this much in a long time. <clears throat> But uh, one sec. Okay. So um, we looked at extreme temperatures. So whether the number of days above 100 degrees Fahrenheit impact plant communities, whether cold days are below freezing, the number of cold days per year. How often um, was there drought within an interval? And then we looked at the variability in seasonal precipitation. So um, how often were winters wetter than normal, drier than normal, and same with summers, how often were they wetter than normal and drier than normal? And when I say normal, I mean in reference to the past 106 year mean of that climate. Um, and then we also looked at the interactions between uh, precipitation and temperature. Um, so what we found, um, so we threw all these variables and models and then um, found that in, including these climate variables only explains between eight to 17% of the variation we see in these, these shifts in our communities. And so what this means is we're not explaining between 90 and 80% of the variation. So I would argue that climate, especially since we're throwing in 15 different variables, isn't really explaining why we're seeing variations in community shifts um, among these census periods. And um, we also found that the interaction between seasonal precipitation and temperature were significant. So um, no single climate factor um, was the most influential um, in driving community change. It's really the interactions between these things. Um, and so I'm gonna show you um, a, one of the results of this. So this is looking at the interaction between having a dry summer in a dry winter. And so as we go left to right, that means um, more years had dry summers in an interval. And if we go from bottom to top, that's more years had dry winters. And then this will be color coded. And as we go from the bottom to top of this color coding, um, we're either shifting to having less cacti species, essentially, or more cacti species, if that's that's a simplified version of those um, community um, 
plots we saw earlier. So blue um, means less cacti species present. Red means more cacti species present. Um, oh, here, yes. So this is um, showing that same graph again, where see the lower numbers and um, mean less cacti species present. And as we shift up here, we have more cacti species. So that's what this gradient is. Um, and so what we find is we get these uh, communities with more cacti species when we have dry summers, but kind of the same amount of um, like average amounts of winter precipitation, or when we have really dry winters, but the average amount of um, summer precipitation. And when we're at the extremes of the two, so really dry summers and really dry winters, um, we lose our cactus species. So it's really the either or, either dry summers or either dry winters, but if you have neither or both, you lose cacti species. Um, and then this is looking at the um, significant climate interactions for that relative abundance. So um, going back to the graphs of this, as we shift from blue to red, we're decreasing the abundance of that, um, that bursage. Um, and left to right are wet summers, so um, more, off, more than average um, precipitation in most of the years. And then from uh, uh, bottom to top, we have an increase in the number of cold days. Um, and so to get this um, decrease, well, I guess the high dominance of ambrosia is this top corner here in the blue. And in order for that to happen, you need both uh, lots of wet summers, but also cool days. When you have anything in between, we lose that dominance of, of the ambrosia species. Um, and so these two examples, um, we simplified what the shifts are to be cacti and ambrosia, but what it really means is the shifts that we're seeing um, depend on the interaction between temperature and wet or dry or like dry and dry combinations. Um, so seasonality of precipitation, temperature and their interaction, we need to know all of it uh, in order to understand the, the, the dynamics of these communities. Those are really graphic representations. I don't know about others, but that, that really, I could, I could really see that. It's a good visualization. Good. Uh, yeah, I've been um, struggling with how to visualize two-way inter interactions can be tough to visualize, so I'm glad that, that you like this. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so to summarize this first part, um, climate doesn't explain much of the variation that we see in these community shifts, um, and that's because they only explain eight to ten 16% of the variation that we're seeing. So that means there's 80 to 90% of things going on that we, we're not accounting for. Um, and there's no single important climate factor um, for community shifts. It's the interactions between the two that, that are very important. Um, so going to the second strength of the data set and on to the next set of Question, Charlotte, based on your last segment. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if among the cacti, uh, I don't know if you were able to track this, but I'm wondering if little species like mammillaria are more vulnerable than the bigger species like barrel cactus and saguaro and so on. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if, if you get uh, severe conditions combined, you lose mammillaria, but maybe the big guys hang on. And if conditions are more benign, you uh, uh, conserve those uh, little species. Sure, yeah. Um, so 
what the next thing that we're going to talk about it's not about the size but it's about grouping species yeah. based on how long they live and their um er, like their early um survival rates um and so we were looking at if these strategies that plants have have differential effects so this is on the wide spectrum not just within cacti um but within the cacti we are seeing like from the last results the the shift to an increase in abundance of cacti based on certain climate variables um so but i don't know off the top of my head whether it's like mammalaria that's the ones that's dropping out um yeah but that's a that's a good question thank you i'll sit tight <laughs> Yeah, um, but let me know if this next section kind of um, addresses some of your some of the question. Um, so, using this tracked individual over time data, um, can we define the the strategies desert plants use, um, and how how is this changing in recruitment and mortality rates? So the first um, question is how many different strategies or life history groupings are there in these Tumamak plant species? Um, and do these different strategies that plants might um, adopt uh, impact their, demogra their demographic responses to climate? So um, do they, are they, do they experience more mortality in certain climates than another strategy that other plants adopt, for example? Um, and so going to this question of just what are these desert plant species doing? Um, this is a graph of the survival functions of 37 different species. And so what the x-axis here is the essentially the maximum age at which we've seen the plant and then um, the y-axis here is how likely are they to survive so these these species here that drop off really quickly that means they 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 die with within the first couple of years of living so they're very short-lived plants whereas species out on this spectrum they live really long and you can either be in kind of this cluster here where you live pretty long and um, you don't, not a lot of your babies die or you live really long and a lot of your babies die. Like a lot of you dies off early on, but you can persist for longer. Um, so I just think it's always interesting to look at all the different ranges of what the species on Tumamak are doing. Um, and just for people's curiosity, these really long lived plants are um, like the wolfberry, white thorn acacia and palo verde. Those are our really long living species. Um, and then the suaro is here. Um, so not as long living for in our data set than these other species, which might seem a little weird, but it kind of shows one of the, the caveats to our data set. One of them being the size of our plots over this 106 years, we've only um, had 30 individual suaros and none of them have been around since 1906. There was like six or so in 1906, but they all died in the fifties. Um, and so, um, our data would suggest that the suaro is not one of the longest living species, um, but but it can get up to um, here we're showing 89 years old. Um, and the other thing is uh, we know that suaros like recruitment is rates are pretty low. They produce a lot of seeds, but survival from like germinating to being an adult is really low in suaros, but we're not seeing that in our data either because our, our um, measure of recruitment is uh, like after it's been established for five to eight years or so because of our census intervals. Um, so there's some species that are doing some things that we wouldn't expect based on um, other data. <clears throat> 
Okay, so we can extract things from these graphs and then see if we can cluster species into similar things. Um, and when we do that, we find that there are three distinct groupings of these desert plant communities. We have um, these blue species here that are just short-lived. Um, they have, they uh, on average live at most 18 years and most of them die early. So their median um, average median age is less than two years. Um, and then we have these longer lived but low early survival plants. So on average living 81 years but most of them dying before the age of six. And then we have this green group here, which are long living plants. The average maximum age is 102. Um, most of them, or half of them, I guess, dying um, by the age 31. So um, the plants on Tumamak Hill, all kind of fall into one of these three groupings. Are they short-lived? Are they long-lived, but most of them die early? Or are they long-lived and more of them can survive early on? And let's try to find the mammalaria. Does anyone see mammalaria? I know they're all on top of each other. I think, I think mammalaria is in this group. So coming back to your, your uh -huh. question, Kara, um, they're short-lived. And so we'll see if that matters for their recruitment and mortality rates in the next couple of slides. Okay. And so looking at how climate is impacting um, species mortality and whether this depends on which life history strategy they are, whether you're short-lived, long-lived and um, differ in your early survival rates. Um, what I'm showing you here is there's points and as you're, if you're on the right side, um, that means this climate variable increases mortality. If you're on the left side, um, the climate variable decreases mortality. And then these are all the different climate variables that we tested, so which we've talked about before. And so of all of the different climate variables we tested, um, only one of them, this dry winter, um, differed based on life history strategy. All the other ones, there weren't a significant um, difference in how climate impacts mortality um, based on life history strategy. And um, what's more is when we plot this, um, it's statistically significant but we could say like the trends aren't super clear. So the, here we're looking at um, how often we have dry winters in an interval and then in, this is mortality. So up here, 100% of the cohort dies, down here 0% does. Um, and so there's differences in baseline rates. So short-lived just have higher mortality than um, long-lived plants. Um, but the, the shifts in these lines is what we care about. So um, the green line is pretty flat, same with red, and you could maybe argue that the short-lived line is increasing as we go left to right. And so what this is saying, what the st statistics is saying, even though it's not a super strong trend, um, is it's these short-lived species that are having differential mortality rates um, depending on the amount of dry winters they have. As you get more dry winters, you get higher mortalities in these short-lived things, but you don't see that with these long-lived species. Um, but just to reiterate the point that that happens for only one of the climate variables out of all of the ones we tested. So it's it's pretty rare that um, life history strategy alters these, um, these trends. Uh, what else we can see from this is that um, here, because drought is, this line is doesn't cross this dash line essentially, and is on the right-hand side, 
an increase in drought um, increases the amount of mortality that we see, which makes sense. And that's not specific to these different life history strategies. And then the other thing that we can pull out from these graphs is that again, these interactions between dry summers and dry winters and temperature and precipitation um, have important impacts for um, species mortality. So looking at those interaction graphs that we um, became familiar with before, um, now we have blue is low mortality, red is high mortality. And so no matter what your life history strategy is, there's more mortality when it's um, wet and hot or average conditions, sorry, wet and cold or average conditions and hot. And then there's also higher mortality when you have um, average conditions or both um, dry in summers and winters. Um, so the amount of mortality that we're seeing in these desert plant species really depends on the interaction between these climate variables. And it's not one or the other driving the patterns that we're seeing. Um, and then when it comes to recruitment, it's the same story um, out of all the climate variables that we've tested, only one of them, there's differential impacts based on life history strategy. And when we look at that, so these are, sorry, let's just say dry summers, but as you increase um, the number of years that have dry summers, you get a decrease in, I should say, recruitment. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> you get a decrease in recruitment as you get more frequency of dry winters. And we're only seeing that pattern in these short-lived plants and not the long-lived plants. Um, and the other thing that we can pull from the recruitment analysis is the, uh, that hot days reduce the amount of recruitment rates that we're seeing and all the other factors, there's no significant effect on recruitment. So climate's having relative to mortality, climate impacts recruitment less strongly than mortality. Um, okay, so coming back to those questions, how many different life, different strategies do the plants on Tumamak have? There's three main ones that differ in um, longevity and early survival rates. And then do these different strategies impact demographic responses to climate? We just saw um, that climate is, the impacts of climate on recruitment and mortality rates are really independent of the life history strategies. There's only some rare cases in which what strategy you have alters the amount of mortality and recruitment you have in different climate regimes. And um, climate has a stronger impact on mortality than recruitment. Um, and I put an asterisk here because this is very counterintuitive to like all knowledge of desert plants where we know that recruitment is like a limiting step in the establishment and growth of plant populations. And again, this is because our recruitment measure here is um, more like early survival because we don't see them when they're babies. We see them when they're five to nine years old because of, because of our senses. So we could be missing actually a lot of the recruitment. Um, so to conclude um, and pull all these things together, um, desert plant communities may be resilient to these decadal scale changes in climate. We saw that climate explains a really low amount of the variation we're seeing in these shifts in communities. And so this could suggest that local factors are more important for desert plant community dynamics than climate alone. And then when life history strategies have differential impacts on recruitment and mortality, um, it's these short-lived species that are being more responsive. So if we wanted to pull at these very few significant results, potentially these short-lived species might be more vulnerable to climate changes than long-lived ones. <clears throat>
Uh, and then this project and this data, like there's so many funding sources and people that are involved. And so I just wanted to acknowledge um, the active plant ecology working group, we call ourselves, and they're the people who have helped me develop um, these questions and work on this data. Um, and I am happy to take any more questions you have. And this is my email in case anyone has any questions that they want to write me or follow up about. Hey, Charlotte. Yes. Can I make it just a comment? Sure. Thanks, Frank. Sure. I, I think that uh, you know the, the way you've assembled the various analytic techniques here and found the ones that work best with this data and allow visualization and interpretation is, I mean, the combination of them is 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 really groundbreaking. You, you've really done the best job of, of finding the right tools and then applying the data. And the data is, you know, pretty iffy in places. <laughs> You know, I mean, yeah. it, it's uh, it could it could do better. And there's, you know, uh, we wish the plots were bigger. We wish they were kind of randomly scattered and all that stuff. But we've got what we got, and this is the best way to go about it. And I think, you know, teasing out what it is that plants are really responding to in the desert is going to consume these data and more in generations to come. One of the observations to make on what you found is that maybe even 106 years of data isn't like even nearly enough. Mm -hmm. It has to be 200 or 300 years before you really see the patterns. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I would agree. That was some complicated, you know, several dimensional variables yeah. that you were able to put together for us to visualize that. Yeah, I mean, I learned that part of the process, you know, on top of the, the data and what the data were showing. I thought that was great. I, I think you ought to share this as a, you know, a la at a lab meeting also, Charlotte. Sure. Yeah, for sure. And I, um, hopefully it'll be a paper, a publication soon. <laughs> so. I, I have, I work on one species, you know, since the 1980s, Tumamak Goldberry which is exclusively a summer perennial. It, it grows, reproduces, seeds germinate and all that stuff exclusively in response to the monsoon. But it confounds me all the time and, uh, and thinking of how that confounding would apply to a whole community of dozens of species. It's just it's overwhelming, the, mm -hmm. the amount of complexity that must be involved. that Mary's got a question. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. I felt like you did a really good job breaking down really complicated statistics that like someone like me could follow. Um, so thank you. Um, my question is like, what, so what's next? Like what's your next, like you summarized and looked at weather and you're kind of now thinking maybe local factors. So I'm assuming that refers to maybe when they put a gate around and reduce the grazing, things like that, is what you're referring to as local factors. So I'm, I'm curious, like, what is the next thing that is to be looked at, like, for this project? Sure, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I uh, personally have a lot of interest in um, species interaction, so how plant-plant, like, competition or facilitation um, might impact community dynamics. And we can't test that directly with this data, but there are a lot of nice techniques because we have mapped individuals. You essentially can look at the density of plants around an individual. And because it's tracked over time, we can know whether if there was more neighbors around it, it had reduced growth than others. And so I wanna start looking at how uh, plant interactions, essentially, I put quotations because we don't measure it directly, might be driving some of the changes that we're seeing. Great, thanks. Barbara's got her hand up. I got my hand up. There we go. Um, yeah, plant fights are cool, so I'm glad you're going to look into that. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
I know that a 100 year old plant survey has got to be a really rare thing in science. Um, I'm wondering if there are any other similar or, I don't know, 20 years and up surveys um, in other areas. Uh, you know, you might think, um, well, this is the desert. These plants are heat adapted. They have a little bit of an edge. Maybe if there's a long-term study in the Arctic or in the tropics, you might be seeing something more dramatic. Is there any chance you've, uh, you know, run through the literature on uh, similar long-term studies like that? Yeah, um, there's a lot of long-term data sets in ecology that's kind of like one of the staples of um, like this work. Mm -hmm. uh, the data we have is what, as we like, what we know the well, old, yeah, um, the oldest where the individuals are mapped through time. Um, there are probably dozens of studies that have at least thirty years of data of composition changes over time. Maybe not mapped individuals. And then when it comes to mapped individuals, there's really large global networks, especially um, with forests of mapped individuals over time. They're not 106 years. I forget when they were established, maybe in the 80s, mm -hmm. um, but that's still 30 years of data. Um, yeah, but I don't, so the, the one like logistical thing about these long-term plots is like you mentioned the Arctic and just based on the, com the community type that it is, mapping individuals like yeah. and is no, no one wants to do it. <laughs> um, so that's why it's kind of um, biome specific, but the Arctic would have um, the community composition through time, just not mapped. Uh -huh. Do you I have too? a question? <laughs> Thank you. If you were you done with that? Yeah. That could probably go on and on. It's a big one. So uh, my question is, and that slide went by too quickly for me to remember who was what, but um, have you looked at these data in relationship to say the um, resilience garden? and the longevity of the species that are edible plants that could be our future um, uh, forage plants and how um, pulling those out and how they would respond to these various factors. I mean, that would be pretty easy to do, just look at the various species, but has, that, has those data been applied there or looked at there? Um. The short answer is no, um, that definitely could be done. And I should maybe talk to the resilience garden folks if that's something that they're interested in. I was working with Jonathan Keeps a bit um, about getting potential growth rates for some like tree species, ironwood, um, but we just don't have enough individuals in the plots. I think we have one maybe ironwood tree. Um, and so I think it, it comes down to what species that they're interested in, but the, um, and whether we have enough data to like gather what the growth rate should be like. Um, um, I, I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, it was just a thought. Uh, Maggie has made a note in the chat here, the UC Natural Reserve System has some data of that type uh, on some of its many reserves. Their website might have information. Maggie, is that, I think you're talking about Barbara's question. Is that right? Sounds like it. Yeah. Um, the first person I would contact would be Jim Andre of the Sweeney Granite Mountain Reserve. He's pretty on top of the vegetation data in the UC system. I haven't been on top of it for a decade or more myself. I also said you sent me a direct message question. Um, in the graph showing change relative to 1906, your zero point for 1906 shows zero change because it compares 1906 with 1906. Yes, that's right. Um, 
it does not show a dramatic change to 1925. Um, I don't know if I understand the second part. Well, I, I think it was mostly the way you put it, comparing the 06 point to the 25 point. And then if you see most of the other points don't show as great a change, but it's all relevant to the 06 point. I think I would have simply left the 06 point out. Oh, yes. Okay, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, uh, it's just a way to visualize um, with, yeah, either way, it, it's the same conclusion that by 1925, the communities were roughly 50% different. Yeah. Any other questions out there? Oh, I guess I have one more. Now I feel like I'm harassing Charlotte, but um, <laughs> uh, and this could be a flight of fancy on my part or misrecollection. I was under the impression that uh, when some of these plots were originally set up, um, they were set up with regard to um, compass points and exposure, you know, north slope, south slope uh, kinds of things, although can't say I saw that in the map. Um, uh, would you happen to have been able to make distinctions between plots based on whether say they had a northern exposure or a southern one in there? Yeah, so you're right. The plots were set up um, essentially to depict different major vegetation types on Tumamak Hill. So in modern day science, they're, they're not replicated like we would want them to be. They were kind of set up because they were different from one another. And so that's why having the different time points is kind of where we can get some of our replication. Um, but because there are so few plots, especially that were tracked through time, only nine, that means we'd only have nine points to compare these these different aspects. I wish I could compare these yeah. like slope and um, things to see if these more local factors are are important or if there's interactions between the two. Um, but just the data is so yeah. so limited for that. But we did see the trend with the soil types because there were enough plots that grouped into either of them. Um, but unfortunately, no, and I wish we could. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we can't go back in time, unfortunately, and set those things up to suit ourselves, but um, it's still wonderful information and so, uh, so rare, and it's great that you're working on it. Well, um... Any other questions? We're coming, well, we're 10 minutes short of the hour. We had a briefer pre-program um, uh, catch up today with Ben being out of town. Um, so uh, I'm fine with that extra 10 minutes this evening. Uh, hope you all are. Any other announcements or anything anybody else wants to share, Mary? Um, just one note, um, we may be send we may be coordinating, we're working on it, uh, trash pickup along Onkelom, probably on the weekends, one of the weekends in April, probably, but just keep an eye out. You see emails from me all the time, but like just scan, if you're, it's not something you're interested in doing, just scan your emails and make sure, I'll, I'll try to put it in the header too. Um, and then sign up for April, will be coming out this week. Um, that's, that's it for me, thanks. Awesome, Mary. Thanks so much. And thanks for your Walker reports. And um, it's nice having your help in all of this. Uh, so again, next month might be the last um, presentation of the spring, and it'll be on the reintroduction of bighorn sheep and the Catalinas. Um, won't be quite as robust uh, data-wise as Charlotte's, but uh, <laughs> it'll certainly be something interesting and relevant, I think, to all of us. So hope to see you there, especially as it's the last one likely of the spring. And um, 
we'll get that email out also so that you have the phone numbers of people you need to have uh, contact information of and the standard protocols. So thanks again, everybody. Happy week, first week of spring.